injects itself into a society. And the question I'm going to ask you that night, if you come and watch it, first of all, we'll have plenty of popcorn for you. The question I'm going to ask you is, could what they did down in Clay County to fix their problems be done with parts of our country that need fixing too? And uh, so if you, have, if you can, come. I think it's, a, it's kind of a fun movie. It lasts about an hour and 20 minutes. Hopefully we'll have a little time for discussion afterwards. Then after that, on March 20th, which is the Tuesday after next Thursday, we've got um, Police Chief of Newtown, and that's Mr. Sinan, who's going to talk about the early warning signs of drug addiction. So if any of your family, let's face it, most of us know somebody that's fallen to, to that, that, that scourge, um, want to kind of get the early signs and what could really be done to maybe fix that problem, come and hear Chief Sinan that night. So um, what I want to do, I've got a, a nice little quick little giveaway, get out your blue tickets and we'll pick a number for you. And um, 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 I'll take those up here. And what we're going to be giving away tonight, this is going to be kind of a fun little gift. Um, right outside in our building, you may have seen it on the way in, we host um, a studio called Visionaries and Voices. It's on the other side of the building, kind of from where we're at right here, so it's straight through there. This is a, a disabled artist studio. About 65 um, disabled artists come in every week and create great art. One of the most famous artists from this group is, a, is an artist by the name of Courtney Cooper. You'll see his work everywhere. You just may not know that's what it is, but he draws pencil drawings of the city of Cincinnati. So tonight we've got some Courtney Cooper note cards and a Courtney Cooper little bag for you. So I'm going to see if I can get our guest who's way in the back to draw a number and we will give that away. Last three numbers are 315. 315, right back here. Your name, sir? Jerry Anders. Jerry Anders. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. Congratulations. Um, and um, one last uh, thing I wanted to tell you about, a couple things actually, real quick. We've got a great session. It's on um, March 29th. It's a state certified class on uh, open records, transparency in government. There's a gentleman in the audience tonight that has, has worked on this class now for two years to get the Ohio Attorney General, who PS, off the record, will not debate his uh, opponent in the primary this um, this May, but he's, he teaches a, a state certified open records class and we've tried for two years to get them to do the class here. All, all elected officials are required to take this class. So this person has worked so hard for the last few years to get that class to happen and we've got 100 people signed up and that's Mr. Janice in the back. Would you raise your hand, Mr. Janice? Let's give him a round, round of applause. Um, we really appreciate him uh, fighting on that for us for the last, uh, last couple of years. Um, so good to see you all here tonight. I want to introduce you to Betty Overstreet, who is our community relations director, who will introduce you to our guest. I think that, yeah, this one works. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to remind you, if you have a question anytime this evening during the presentation, please raise your hand so that we can get a microphone to you so those in back of you and those online can hear the question. Major Timothy Anglin deployed as the Director of Operations 387th Air Expeditionary Squadron, Ali Al Salam Air Base, Kuwait. He provided administrative and operational control to over 350 joint expeditionary task jet airmen and indiv individual augmentees. Serving at numerous locations throughout the Levant and other Gulf Coast countries in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. As an Ohio Air National Guardsman, Major Anglin is the F FSS Director of Operations in Columbus, Ohio. 
As the Director of Operations, he administers and supervises the FSS staff in their support of the 121 ARW to ensure mission readiness of over 1,200 personnel that serve our communities, state and nation, for both homeland defense and federal missions. Major Anglin entered service in 1985 and has served in various operations and command positions in the United States Air Force and Ohio Air National Guard and was acting commander of the 123rd Air Control Squadron and served as the J-1 for the state headquarters Ohio Air National Guard. Please give Major Anglin a warm welcome. Anybody? So, so what you saw, a lot of that was from the first desert storm. And where I was stationed at, I was like six miles from that, where a lot of that happened. So at Ali al-Salim, it was the first base that the Iraqis took over during desert storm. And what they did was pretty amazing. You have to give them credit. They had a convoy of military people. They rolled up to the gate and they said, hi, we're here for a military exercise. And they let them in and the base was taken over in like seven minutes. 
So they did a great job. But a lot of the stuff that you saw destroyed the tanks. You may see pictures of those coming up again. So stay on the edge of your seat. This is going to get good. Any questions before we start? All right, here we go. So this is about Kuwait, where I was stationed the majority of the time. I've been there a couple twice. Ali Asalim. So if you see where Iraq is, I, I was very close to the Iraqi and Saudi Arabian border. Just, just have a little pointer on it. Okay. So if you, in the background here, this is the city, uh, Kuwait City. Let me go back to the map. So you see where the little Kuwait and the star is? That, that's their capital. The whole size of this country is, is like New Jersey, so it's a very small country. But these are their famous water towers. So a, a funny story with them is Saddam really wanted to destroy these, so he kept shooting them with cannon with their water towers, so the bullets would just go in and out. So he, obviously he never succeeded in taking them down. And as you can see, they look pretty cool at night now. Their city, I mean, it's funny, you're gonna see some of these pictures that I show with, you can really tell it's a third world country, but in the city, I mean, it's, it's pretty nice with their oil money. And what's every country have? Mickey D's. So, so this, was, this was near their souks, which is like their, like their flea markets. So, I mean, like you say, if you look at their buildings, they're pretty amazing. All right, so in the beginning, where'd they start off at? So mostly they, were used, they used the British to help support them because they were such a small country. Uh, they were claimed by Iraq in 61. So if you notice with the map, Iraq has no major water sources to, to the Gulf. So all they have to, to get their oil, they have to go down the, the river. So obviously they want, they want to get as much oil out as they can to get more of our money. And that's why they took over Kuwait, so they'd have access to the ports. And again, they were invaded in 1999. The country was occupied for seven months. And any guesses who they were saved by? Anyone? Hey, give it up. <laughs> good, old, good old USA. So welcome Ali Asalim Air Base. Look pretty nice. You guys want to go to anybody that, for vacation plans here? Wait, wait till you see the nice accommodations I had. You're going to be impressed. So the nickname for the base is The Rock because there's a lot of sand and there's a lot of what? Rock. <laughs> I like it, this picture in the background. You see our T-walls, our barriers to keep the bad guys from getting in. But, but you see what all the guys who are deployed do? We, we paint them. So if you kind of look in the one on the right, those are all dedicated to the 9-11. So those were all painted up pretty neat. So. It's almost an art in itself, how they do this. There's an aerial shot of the base. Does anybody know the local uh, air control squadron around here in Cincinnati? The 123rd Air Control Squadron in Blue Ash? So they're a radar unit. That was our radar on the hill. Controlled all the planes flying in and out of Iraq. I actually worked, if you looked at the, at the radar, if you look to the left and you'll see the tent in the big building, that was one of the places where I hung out. I, I worked on uh, air conditioners and generators. Everything was generator power. If you kind of look at the, uh, to the left of the radar and you see the camouflaged areas, our, all our generators were underneath there. Worked pretty good, does anybody know those were generators? <laughs> So the, these are their, their big things that were built by the uh, French. They were indestructible, could not be damaged. Anybody know who did the damage? USA. So <laughs> I don't think they got their money back on these either. A little view from the inside, mostly made out of sand and concrete. And that still, it's been that since 1990. They still look like that. So all those tanks you saw destroyed on the highway between Iraq and uh, Kuwait, there they are. 
look good, make great lawn ornaments. Sheep love them. <laughs> okay, land and climate. It's a desert, hot and dry, no rivers, no creeks. So when I left, I left July 31st, the temperature was 125 degrees. I, I lost 14 pounds my last month there. It was so hot. First place I flew into was Ireland. It was 57 degrees. I bought a sweatshirt pretty quick. <laughs> Again, range 108 to 115. Like I said, we hit 125. And a couple years ago, they broke the record and they hit 129. So when they, say a, when they talk about the hot areas, that's one of them. And I don't care what people say. It's a dry heat. It's hot. So again, no rivers, no creeks. How do they get their water? Any guesses? Desalination. So this is one of their plants. We did not drink their water. We, we would use uh, bottled water, everything, for brushing our teeth and everything. So when they have the uh, sandstorms, which would hit, at the time when I worked on air conditioning, one of my jobs was cleaning the filters of the air conditioners. You had to do that once a month. It never failed. The day I cleaned them, we would hit, get hit with a sandstorm. Ah, one of my little buddies. This is the famous camel spider. Yes. I remember I saw one one time, I was in the, sh we had trailers and we'd take our showers in the trailers and I was telling these guys earlier, you know, I would look up and I'd be like, okay, it's not a spider, it's not a spider. And then I'd look up, please don't fall, please don't fall. <laughs> but they're famous for uh, following your shadow. They stay, they get in the shadow to stay cool. So like when you're walking, they'll walk with you in your shadow and people will run and they will stay right there with them. It's pretty comical when it happens. They're, they're just like the tarantula, so it'll, yes. So I can get you a couple, it's still boxed up. Okay. All right. Uh, th this is, they call it the, the dub, dub lizard. They could get up to three to four feet. They, they call them dub dub because that's the sound it makes when the car runs them over. It's like, because they get on the roads. To <laughs> but they were, they were pretty fun. All right. Anybody remember this old show tune? There once was a Kuwaiti named Jed, barely kept his camels fed. 1938, oil discovered in Kuwait. They supply 10% of the world's reserves, which makes them have a lot of money. Our, our money is not worth much there. And we're, we're talking about that in a couple slides. So th this is a single family home. Yeah. <laughs> Their, their, their families, uh, they have multiple wives, but they're, uh, and we'll talk about it later, but their first wife has to be Kuwaiti or they lose all their rights to get, getting the oil money. But most of the families, not that big. Again, some of their homes. That's right off I-75. There's our Motel 6. <laughs> We'll leave a light on for you. There you go. So if you notice in the left corner at the top, you see the water bottles? That was our air conditioning system. You, you give military guys enough time, they'll make anything work. All right, so they use the KD, Kuwait Diener. Again, it's like three of our dollars for one of theirs. Like I said, one of the few times where our money's not tops. But in every country, Kroger's. Uh, prior to doing business going overseas, we get lots of shots. Uh, typhoid, yellow fever, polio. I also had to get a uh, smallpox, which was, so like how many of you guys got that when you were a kid? So remember it was a one-time deal? Well, for the military, one-time deals are every 10 years. So I had to get all those little, remember all those little needles? Same thing, it was just as fun. Again, customs restrictions, no alcohol, no pork, no porn. Repeat, no alcohol. All right, doing business. 
they're they're kind of they live they'd have their own little timeline like we're here in america we're always you know if i if we get to be here at seven you know we're here at 6 45 you know just the way you're doing over there it's whenever we'd set meetings up with them sometimes they'd show up but sometimes they didn't we, we'd call it having tea with them so and again they want you to you know talk around a little bit they don't go right to business um they, they like to meet with people after 6 p.m., but that's because it's so hot. <laughs> you can't blame them. In one of the locals, to, to have a business over there, you have to have a sponsor. You know, so this, this guy is not from Kuwait. Um, it's amazing. I think, uh, I want to say the stat is like 40 or 60% of the country is people that they bring in to work for them. So they, if you're Kuwaiti, you got it made. So they work Sunday to Thursday. Uh, Friday is their, like our Sunday. And then they use a different year than we do, in the 1 April to 31. Times in, we were eight hours ahead. So makes great for calling home. Everybody's in the middle, sleeping in the middle of the night. Or I, it's funny now with our new, uh, with our media, you know, people can send you texts and all that. And I got so many texts at two or three in the morning. Um, some of them Arabs sit, talk, and stand closer than us. Anybody see the uh, close talker episode with the Seinfelds? You know, it's, it's common for them to, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing? Get, get up nice, close, and personal, which we have our personal space, right? So, uh, they dress modestly. You'll see some of their clothing. Expect to be touched frequently by members of the same sex. And again, the, their handshake could last the entire conversation. So, you know. This whole presentation, I'm going to shake his hand. No, just kidding. <laughs> this is one of the Kuwaitis. We're, we'll see some of the differences in, in the dress. So if you're a Kuwaiti, you'll wear the white. So that's how they can kind of tell who the rich folks are and who the workers are. The camels in the background, any guesses on how much those cost? Anybody? I'll, I'll tell you this. There's, camels are not... not um, domestic to, or natural in Kuwait. They're only brought in for races and, and shows. And these people have a lot of money. So these camels, believe it or not, 250,000 a piece. Babies, 60 to 70,000. And, and you'll see how big these herds are. And, and it's just a status symbol. Some of them might have eight or nine herds. You know. Again, it's not what you know, it's who you know. That's why I'm glad I know Ray. <laughs> uh, like I said, every business must have a Kuwaiti associate. Uh, typically, you pay that person. You know, in a lot of the countries, you'll pay $50,000 to go over there for a business, and a Kuwaiti can have 10 or 11 people that he sponsors. So there's half a million a year he's making just so you can try to make it as a, biz as a business. Uh, all their enlisted members of the military are mercenaries. The officers are uh, Kuwaiti. You know, with them being mercenaries from other countries for the enlisted, that could be a big reason why when the Iraqis pulled up to the gate and said, hi, we're here for an exercise, they're like, sure, we don't care, go on in. Again, foreign workers constitute 98% of the private sector workforce. So. So, so at this Friday's, what, what's missing? Somebody's paying attention. Another Mickey D's. But, but they take great pride in making it look like ours. Does that look pretty, just like one you'd see here? All that money. And there's their bathroom. <laughs> Anybody want to see that again? <laughs> so again, their government, the executive branch, run by the emir, you know, he, he picks who's going to take his place. Uh, the emir, his, his one uh, little castle or palace was like six blocks long, and it had speed bumps in front of it. And we could tell whenever the king was getting ready to go out because they would remove all the speed bumps so he wouldn't have to feel the bumps. And then the next day, they would be right back up again. So good to be the king. They have 50 members in their legislative branch. They're elected for four years. 
again, Islamic law, and then some of the stuff they do, OPEC, Interpol, World Trade. Again, for, to vote, only adult males who have been naturalized for 30 years or more or have resided in Kuwait since before 1920 and their male descendants at age 21, only 10% of the people can vote. But public health care, free of charge to residents of Kuwait. Uh, the good king also pays for any animals killed along the highway. And we, we always thought it was crazy. Like, even like on the highway, like I-75, you would see a herd of goats or camels go across. Because if, if you hit one, the king will either replace it, or if you hit it during daylight hours, you have to pay for it. So you have to watch their law. Because they figure if it's during the day, you should be able to see them. At night, if, if you hit one, it's their fault. Again, there's, there's the herd in the background. This guy, one of the, the herders, he was from Sudan. So he made about $400 a month. He stayed with them camels 24-7. His job was to exercise the camels. So he would walk them from 6 in the morning till 6 in the afternoon every day. Okay, 79% uh, of the population literate, only one university, place is pretty big, it's, it's um, I want to say it was like 40 miles from Kuwait City, it was like halfway between the base and Kuwait City from where I was at, but it was, it was pretty impressive, and again, if, free for all Kuwaiti citizens, so we, how many of you guys have paid for your kids to go to college, be nice here, huh? Again, about 2 million people there. Again, a lot of those non-nationals. We, we were close to Al Jara, and it's the biggest recruiting area for ISIS. It's right next to where we were. So a lot of the nationals they bring in, they don't really, they let them all come in. So They spoke Arabic, Hindish, or Hindu, English, Kurdish, uh, Islam, 100%. They pray five times daily. Uh, we had a Kuwaiti base on the outside of ours, and we would hear the prayers go off. And when they pray first light, so sometimes the sun comes up three in the morning in the desert, so we would hear those horns blaring. Great when you're tired. But kids are kids everywhere, right? So, so the men's wear the long light robe, reaches their ankles, and we're going to see a picture of that. So it's kind of hard to see, but their escalators I thought was neat. They had flat escalators. So people could take like their shopping carts, put it on the escalator, and it would take the cart up, which was pretty neat. Again, they can have more than one wife. First wife must be Kuwaiti. You know, and when they marry somebody foreign born, they have to get government approval. And some of their outfits. Women wear the same thing. A lot of what they wear it's dictated by the husband or their father. So they said they'll wear some, these were, would be not Kuwaiti women. These would be some of the non nationals. Again, potential for women, women are not allowed to vote. Educated women have limited career opportunities, but they're doctors, engineers, bankers. Uh, violence against women is a big problem in Kuwait. You know, we, we even had to watch. If our girls would try to go downtown wearing shorts, which is a big no-no, sometimes the crowds would chase them, but we always made sure everybody stayed together when we went downtown. So there's some of the women. But if you look at the floor of the mall, I mean, they're, they're nice. Customs and courtesies, important to sit properly. Uh, one of the things is, you know, that you can't sit with your sole, your feet facing them. Uh, be careful about admiring stuff. Like, like if you say, hey, I like this, they'll try to give it to you. It's their culture. And again, if somebody lights a cigarette or chews gum or whatever, you know, you're expected to do it, give it to everybody, not just do it by yourself or you go without. Native gestures, middle finger, universal everywhere. Shaking head in yes motion while clicking. Shaking hands using the left hand. Even waving with the left hand would drive them crazy. A lot of times if people cut us off, we would sneak and wave with our left hand and watch them get irate in the, you know, in the rear view mirror. So it's kind of a little fun thing for us. So 
So they, they like the uh, American cars. This is one of the car shows I went to. Kind of neat seeing our stuff over there. <laughs> so they like uh, riding go-karts, golfing, camping. I, I golfed over there. So what kind of uh, area am I in? It's a desert. It's all rock. So they give you a carpet that you carry. And I, I hit a golf ball, and I bet I drove it 500 yards. It went 20 yards in the air, and then it bounced and rolled forever. <laughs> we had fun. It's funny, like eating at American restaurants, all their malls have all American stores, American restaurants. I used to think it was funny. Guys would be like, let's go to the mall. I'm like, you can do that at home. <laughs> it's the same stuff as we have. Uh, there's one of the T-walls. So on the right one, the, 120, the one team, one fight, the 123rd Air, Contr Air Control Squadron, located in Blue Ash. The one on the right, that's part of my uh, 121st out of Rickenbacker, the Force Support Squadron. Doing the OH. All right. And that was my crew from, uh, I was at, they were, I had uh, one, the one girl next to me was at the same base as I was. The other group that I had from Ohio were at a whole different base. And of course, what a better place to meet than the old Camel Crossing sign, right? Uh, Kuwait, Kuwaitis use food to convey hospitality and uh, generosity. You know, they're always wanting to have coffee or tea with you. Uh, the one camel farm where I went all the time, when I told them I was leaving, they actually made a great big feast for me, which I thought was pretty nice. But they roll out the carpets, and they bring the teapots and the fresh fruit. It was, it was pretty fun. Anybody know what that is? I ate it, and I still don't know what it was. <laughs> I was hoping somebody here knew, but... <laughs> <laughs> so there's one, of the, one part of the malls. Baskin Robbins. So again, they like the malls, local bazaars, Shark Mall. That was right on the marina. You'll see some of the insides. So it's funny, the malls are nice and clean, and you'll see some other pictures soon where you'll see that all the garbage is just swept into the streets. Little radio store. Uh, one of the things that they do with their shops is they put all the same thing in one area. So like if you need tires, there's 30 tire shops on one street, and that's it for the whole area. I mean, just like well, we can go different places all over, they have it all in one. And we're like, how do you know which one to go to? They're all the same. All lit up. Again, here's the only reason camels are in Kuwait is for the races. So 2003 winner and placer, Faha Hill side. So Faha Hill means, anybody? Anybody remember who won in 2003? Funny side. Sorry, a little ill attempt at humor. Some more camels right outside the gate. Here's my buddies. The one on the right would come running through the desert. I would get there right at around 6.30 when the guy was bringing the herd back, and the one on the right would come running to me and then take its head and pull me into it and give me a hug. So that was one of the things that made my deployment. There's a newborn, but look at the garbage in the background. So, so the, the, it's free to camp in Kuwait. So they all have these tents they put up there. You'll see Mercedes right outside of them, but they can go out there. They do that in the winter months. They'll go out and camp. I'm the one on the left, in case you're wondering. <laughs> you can see how uh, happy the... Uh, Camel looks, don't you? He's showing that free dental plan they have too. So.
Again, they love the boating. They have the old boats. Look pretty cheap, don't they? <laughs> There's the old Dows. Yeah, a Ramadan month. Um, again, it's against the law to eat, drink, anything in public during daylight hours. So we, we would follow that if we were out in public. On base, we, we didn't have to worry about it, but if we were off base, we were under those same restrictions. Again, they're, they're not eating. Like I said, the sun comes up at a lot of times around 3 in the morning, and then it goes down 8 or 9 at night. So they go all day without eating. They're very angry. It's one of the worst times for us. I, you know, in the months, it lasts a month. So if you starve all day for a month, you'll get pretty in a bad mood. So, Hey, Christmas. No snow, but we make do. Again, they operate on a class system. They are first-class citizens. They consider themselves the chosen ones, so anyone else is inferior. Uh, we were considered second-class, and then all the other foreigners that they bring to work with them are the third-class citizens. So they really didn't like us much. The ones they brought in didn't like us much, so fun, fun. Again, there's our patriots. Anybody ever see a patriot before? Here's our security. Every time we went off base and came back on, you had to check your vehicle. If I drove to the mall when I got out, I would, when I was getting, before I got in the car, we would all have to walk around the car, look underneath it. They, they like taking wires with hand grenades and putting them on the wheels. So when the wheels move, it pulls the thing out. So we constantly had to look for that. And here's our big security. So they'd have the bomb sniffing dogs. All right, out of all this, what's the most important thing you guys can remember? <laughs> no alcohol. So my deployment was 195 days with you know, no beer, no nothing. Anybody have any questions? You need to mic them up or? Hold tight, please. Ma'am, would you say your first name, please? Oh, I'm Nancy. First time here. I'm just curious. You got went over there to protect Kuwait from Iraq, and they hate, and they hate us? Or they didn't like us? Uh, they want to kill you? Or? Not always. They don't all want to kill. But like I said, they consider themselves the chosen ones. So we're, we're kind of beneath them. So. It's very colorful, all that you've been through, but how long were you there? Uh, I, I was, this time I was there for 195 days, so over, over six months. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and that's, if you know anybody that's getting ready to deploy, that's, that's about the average, 195 days. They, they want you to be in country for 180 days, and they want you to have like a two week, a week when you get there to work with the person replacing, and then a week to train your replacement. And it's funny, if a unit goes over there, you cannot leave until you are physically replaced. So if you're in a unit and there's 100 people and the next unit that comes in has 99, and that 100 was not your guy, you're stuck until you're replaced. So. Other questions for our guest? Hi, my name's Leslie. You said 100% Muslim. I'm assuming they're Sunni. Not Shia? I'm pretty sure they were mostly Sunni, but I okay. think there were some other ones there too. Okay. What surprises me is they like American culture so much that they would have all those stores. Yes. They don't like Americans. That was very interesting. Yeah. It, it's funny. A lot of times I've been, to Tur I've been to so many different countries, but a lot of them all make fun of us. But usually the last question I get is, how do you get here? So. Uh, my name is Bob. Hi, Bob. <laughs> well, when you got to Ireland and you bought that sweater, did you get a glass of beer with that? I sure did. <laughs> Anybody know what beer I had? Guinness is good. It's a lot better over there. 
what was the threat level like? What did you, did you feel, I mean, did you, did you sense that you were under threat or was it not a big concern to you? I, I wasn't that concerned. And I traveled throughout Kuwait all the time because there's multiple bases there and I had multiple people working at them. So I was constantly on the go. But I mean, it's just like you do everything. You're always on alert. You know, you're always looking for it. And I, I think that helps deter a lot of it. My name is Ray. Um, who controls the front gate at this time? Uh, it, it's us. Today. It, it, it is us. It, it is our, our, it was our military guys. For, for a while, they used to have civilian contractors that they brought over. But now it is us. It's our Air Force people. I, it's funny, the base I was at, Ali Asalim, the first time I was there, it was a Kuwaiti base. We were borrowing it. And now it is an official Air Force base. So it's ours. Are there people who get over there that just can't adapt to the country? They're sick all the time. I mean, is, is that a problem? Uh, some, sometimes it is. Do and they get to go home or what? <laughs> like I said, you have to be replaced. So it, it all depends. I mean, there's people that you'd see them break arms, break legs, and they're working on crutches. Um, but talking about sickness, so, I mean, what, it's very important because we're all confined in a very tight area. You know, so if one person gets sick, it, it, it spreads through the base like you would not believe. So there's hand washing stations everywhere. Before you go to eat, you have to wash your hands. I mean, there's no choice. But everything we did, we were constantly washing hands. Because like I said, if we lose half our base to illness, you know, there's the mission. My name's Ken. Uh, did you get to meet any of the locals and get invited to anybody's home? Or is that strictly taboo since they're first class citizens and we're second class citizens in their uh, eyes? No, like remember they, they threw a feast for me when I left. So you saw the picture where I was next to the Kuwaiti, his family, and he didn't speak any English. His son spoke very good English. And it was funny, his son actually had a pretty good sense of humor because they always want to give you coffee and it was like a hundred and something degrees. And I don't like coffee anyway. And he offered me coffee, and I must, it must have shown something in my face. And he's like, yeah, when it's 100 and something degrees, coffee's not a good idea. So, so but I mean, all the other ones, if, if I would have said I wanted it, they would have drank it right there with me. My name's Ray, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what type of aircraft do we have there at that base, if any? Oh, there was mostly the big uh, transport things. We had the uh, Predator. So we had the, um, for the bombings, we had the KC-135s. A couple of the other bases had the F-15s. So right around us within, you know, within 100 miles, we had every type of aircraft you could think of. You know, so we had the attack, we had, you know, to take supplies, drop bombs, we could do it all within that area. Now, what was it like? Did you have like American TV there or uh, everything wired or how'd that work? <laughs> so, the only thing they have is Air Force Network, which is like regular TV, except there's no commercials, except for military commercials. And I don't know if you can get on YouTube and look for AFN commercials that when you see them for about 60 times, you know, and then again, the time difference, like I watched the Super Bowl, you know, it started like at one at night, you know, one in the morning and we all watched it and then went, went to work the next day. And like how many channels would you have? We didn't have many channels. <laughs> I want to say we had like eight channels. Now, could you call home as much as you wanted to? You, or You can call home. I, I was telling some people, if you know somebody going to Kuwait or check the countries, uh, T-Mobile is free as far as doing like texting and FaceTime. So a lot of people switch to T-Mobile when they go over there. If you're thinking about sending stuff to people, you know, it's funny. We get so much candy and junk food. And even though it's funny, when you're over there, everybody gets healthy. You know, you all start working out and everybody goes on a diet. But guess what's the first thing that disappears when those packages come in? But, but for the ones that are healthy, you know, like they got the jerky. You know, there's a lot of jerky around here. There's that, um, I think Wild Joe's is downtown Cincinnati. is a local company. Uh, I know there's a Sullivan's Food Mart that makes a local jerky. But stuff like that is always good to send to them. Right here. Okay. Hi, uh, Dan. Hi, Dan. Uh, hi. I have actually two questions. One I thought was kind of cool was, uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, that camel that was unique? Do you did you work with him that 
that uh, they would create that bond. Usually you have to feed an animal in order to get a relationship like that. And then the second one is uh, on the HVAC side, uh, I would think you would be a very a valuable person over there, even to the locals that, hey, this guy can help you with your air conditioning. Yeah. yeah. When I did the air conditioning the first time I was there, I, I like to think I was the coolest guy on base. Uh, I'll tell you a little funny story. For, for my unit, I was the only AC guy. And it was funny, guess what shift they started me off on? Night shift. And after they woke me up a few times, they realized this guy needs to stay on days the whole time. But where I had the advantage, well, you saw the, the hooch that we stayed in. Well, they had all the night crew guys in one. Well, I stayed in there. So I ended up having that almost to myself, you know, at night. So it worked out in my favor on that one. And as far as the camel goes, uh, the, the owner used to swear that they're like uh, elephants, that they have a memory they never forget. But I don't know why I bonded with that one. I mean, it always came to me. It, if other camels got near me, like, because they can get aggressive, you know, it would, she would come over and block it. I mean, it was, it was pretty neat. So, so it's a good friend to have. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny. One of their famous sayings over there is, is when the camel spits, duck. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> Tim, no. we have an online question. Were you armed at all times? N not at all times. There's times when I went places I would be armed. So we would carry the M9 or, or the uh, M4, which is like an M16. You didn't carry anything when you went into the malls? No, just my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's neat with uh, the way they deploy now. You know, it used to be like one service would do everything. It's really now a joint environment. They kind of take the best groups of each other, that everybody has the offer and puts them in to do everything. And, uh, but you can still tell the differences between the services. And I, I was talking about the scorpions over there when I was earlier. And uh, when, when you get there, you get the big briefing by the general and they have everybody in a room like this. And he's, you know, you're, you're day one, you know, everybody's nervous and the general asks the question and he goes, what would you do if you found a scorpion in the tent where you were sleeping? And this army guy raises his hand. He says, I would step on it. This Navy guy says, I would take a shovel and hit it. This Marine's like, I would rip off its tail and eat it. <laughs> you, you know them Marines? They're always hungry. And my, my Air Force boy made me so proud. He raised his hand. He's like, what's, what's a tent doing in my hotel room? <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you were over there, were you near the, any of the oil fields that were destroyed? I remember seeing pictures of all that oil that was burning. We, we were close to that. that. That was more close to uh, Kuwait City. But, you know, but I mean, a lot of, the, the first time I was there, that was in uh, 99. And you, like anywhere you went through the towns, through the malls, bullet holes were everywhere. It, and what's pretty amazing about what Iraq did is when, not only did they take that country over in a day, they had already made street signs. So just imagine you're sleeping here at home and you wake up, somebody's in your country and they've changed all your street signs. You know, instead of Kemper Road, you know, you got Ali Ah Kemper, you know. I mean, I mean, how crazy would that be to wake up to that? Now, what, what are the politics like over there? Is it kind of a 50-50? Is it, is it strong one way or another? Is that allowed or is that kind of hushed up or how does that work? You, you cannot talk like the politics and religion, but um, it's the king. So. I mean, the politics of like the people on the base oh, sorry. For, for what's going on in America. Uh, well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys on the, on the base were, when everything started with, with our new president, you know, he, he went with more bombings to help protect us. And our bombings quadrupled. And, and then while I was there, we took over one of ISIS's uh, main cities. We took over Raqqa. And then we took over another of their capitals by the time I left. So it, took, it saved so many lives for that to happen. So you, were the, so you guys were happy about that? We, we were happy about that. Other questions for our speaker who's got one? Right there. Hi, my name is Jay. I have a, a question. Thinking back, basically, we saved them during the, the war. Yes. And you're telling me, if I understand this, they're 
the military and the their civilians are basically anti, against American military and the American people are? I mean, not all of them, but like I said, they consider themselves the chosen people. So anyone that's not one of them is beneath them. So, I mean, it's just, it's their culture. It's just how they think. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Dwayne. I, I, I'd like to ask what is our defined mission there then now? And under what arrangements or agreements do you all stay there? Well, you remember, we're, we're, we're trying to stop ISIS. And one of the main reasons we go over there so freely is because I would rather be 7,000 miles from my home so you guys can get up every morning and not have to worry about going out and seeing a fight in your own backyard. So, thank you. <laughs> Quick question about language. Yes. Um, were you able to pick up any Arabic and also to read the Arabic script? Because it's one thing when they put it in Eng you know, English yes. letters, but the script is very difficult to read. It, and not only is it difficult to read, you know, like we write left to right, they're right to left. So, and I did not pick up anything other than Marhava, which is hello, Marhava. They love Salam, you know, for hello, goodbye, my good friend. So it was all Salam, but I, I didn't pick up the language too well. Any other questions from anyone? You guys have a lot of great questions. Well, let's thank our guests for coming tonight. What an interesting, uh, interesting talk. Thank you so much. And now, where are you centered at now? Uh, so right now, I'm assigned to uh, the 121st at Rickenbacker, the Force Support Squadron. But I've taken a new job. So that there's a group called DLA, Defense Logistics Agency. And they're based out of Columbus, the DSCC, Defense Supply Center Columbus. And they have an emergency response division. So they go to international and international. They responded to the Houston hurricanes. They did the Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico storms. And it's a joint position. So Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines. And I got selected to be the Air Force lead. So I'll be in charge of that on the Air Force side of the house, which will get me promoted to, anyway, Lieutenant Colonel. So. And Tim, you, you mentioned on the radio about local companies sending uh, care packages, something like that, too. Yes. Grippos, I remember. Yes, Grippos. I, I use Grippos a lot. My son loves Grippos. And uh, if somebody's in an APO, they usually ship for free. So, so you got a relative going there and you want to give them something from Cincinnati, Grippos potato chips. Uh, there's also a group called the Good Timers. Has anybody seen their flyers? So they, they, they sent me an 80 pound package once a month. And it was almost like clockwork. I got this big 80 pound package full of goodies. And like I said, and no, I didn't eat it all myself. I share with everybody. Okay, okay just, I'm, I'm, I might've missed something. Sorry, sorry. So if we would decide, if Empower You would decide to send a bunch of stuff over there, how would we do, how would we do it? Uh, you could, a big thing is if you know somebody, yeah. get their address and like, like say the, like, the 123rd deployed, they got back in January of last year. So they won't be due for a while, but like if there's any local units, you know, if you knew them, you could get their address and just mail it to them direct. Okay. You know, like I said, they'll have that APO address. Right. right. You know, but like I said, there's a group, the Good Timers, they look to try to find all the locals in the area. You know, I wasn't the only one that received that package. I think they said they had like 16 or 17 other locals they were doing the same thing for the good timers the good timers right 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 um any possibility you might ever go back you think or well you, usually you, they call it you're in your buckets you know like when i was with the blue ash i was in a different bucket and i went to the 121st which put me in another bucket and now that i'm going to another one i could actually end up being right back out there next year so is there some amount of time that they will only let you go over so many times they usually want you to go like at the most once every two years for, and that's for the hundred and for the 195 days. So that's like one, one out of like one fourth of two years yes. would be the most. And, and I had a, so if you, if you saw my patch when we talked about the jet IAs, so the people I worked, I was in charge of were so army and Navy Marines, sometimes they're short in career fields and the air force supplies them with people. 
but those people get caught in their system. So my, my squadron, our job was to take care of the Air Force people. So that, that was my job with them. So it was very interesting with the, all the different jobs. Hmm, great. Thank you so much for coming tonight. One more round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And um, okay, so um, I don't know, teaching this Empower You class, I don't know if I'm allowed to let you guys out early tonight at all. So I'm going to just talk to you. No. Um, thanks for coming tonight. And um, we're going to look what forward to seeing it? you Thursday night for our what session on robots and the future. And uh, it's going to be fun. So I have a great night, everybody. Come and uh, thank our guest, and we'll see you all. Have a great night. Don't get blown away. <laughs>